Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kristen Muller, Director of Peters Valley. For those of you that don't know me, I am so pleased that you're joining us. So a number of years ago, Bruce mentioned that the beautiful Noborogama kiln that we had was coming to the end of its lifespan. It was built by Ruggles and Rankin, I think in 1991. And it's a big undertaking to rebuild a kiln because number one, you're not starting fresh, right? You need to take it all down and then put it back up again. And it was a very expensive investment. And we were wondering how we were gonna do it. And I have to say that thanks to all of you, um, it, it, the, it became a reality, you know, in a year in 2020, when all seemed to be lost, right? And it, just around this time, we started hearing about this pandemic that uh, forced us to close the campus and figure out how we were going to get through this. And I have to say that the brightest spots have been, you know, being able to get together with with people when we bring artist lectures and the fact that we've been able to make investments in Peters Valley, like rebuilding of the kiln, who would have thought? So um, I just wanna thank everyone who made this possible. First with um, Bruce who agreed to do this project to undertake this, uh, the board that helped uh, approve all of this process, the 201 donors, 201 individual donors that contributed, the John and Margaret Post Foundation who donated, and the Julia Turr Fund for the Ceramic Arts, which I understand has funded quite a few kilns around the country in memory of Julia Turr. And we were so lucky to, to get this additional funding, which helped us close the gap, close the loop so we can make it possible. So $40,000, two years later, Bruce will tell you how many bricks later. Um, we have this beautiful kiln, but I, I want to highlight a few other people. Uh, Bruce and his am amazing vision and hard work, his beautiful wife, Clovinda, who supports him in all of this and photographs and documents. Thank you, Clovinda. Charlie Lid, who's been Bruce's silent partner in firings and, and technical repairs over the last 20 years. Thank you, Charlie. And Max Seinfeld, who was once our assistant, studio assistant and remains part of our community for coming to help Bruce. And there's a, the, cement company that donated some cement to us also in Sussex County that helped us get this together. So uh, without further ado, thank you. And we look forward to a bright future of Peters Valley and the, the maiden firings. I hand you over to Bruce Daynert. Yay, Bruce. Thank you, Kristen. I really appreciate it. Um, there have been, like Kristen was saying, there are so many people and organizations and so forth to thank, and, and it's a fool's errand to, to try to get in there and, and do all of it to, a, to an appropriate level, you know, but um, suffice it to say that I really, I can't thank all of you enough um, for joining us this morning and for those of you who contributed to the project in any way, shape or form, um, you know, my heart goes out to you. Uh, it's been quite a, quite a project. And, uh, and so with it comes a lot of emotion for me. We're entering a new era um, with, the, with a new kiln. It's the uh, same basic kiln as the one before. We were very careful, we being Charlie and I and Max and Covindo, were very careful to uh, look after um, trying to, make sure we understood that design as we as we started to take the kiln apart. But um, uh, thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Lakota. Thank you, Brianne, for always uh, reminding me that we needed to do this dedication. And, uh, and a special thank you to Grace uh, Ref, who is our development director. Grace was uh, with us from the very beginning of the project and, and helped uh, shepherd us through the fundraising for it. And uh, I really appreciate all her efforts. Um, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate Charlie Lid 
and Max Seinfeld and Covinda for um, Covinda, as Kristen said, documented the project as we went. And uh, Charlie was my everyday guy. Um, and so I'm going to do a screen share. The, the schedule for this is I'm going to show a PowerPoint on the little bit of the demolition of the previous kiln um, and then uh, some somewhat detailed uh, images of the rebuild of the kiln. So for those of you who are kiln builders out there, uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. For those of you who aren't, I hope you enjoy it. Um, uh, but uh, the potters and the sculptors and so forth who are joining us this morning, I think will, will uh, enjoy seeing the evolution of the, of the, the kiln. So, um, and then we're going to go outside and do a, a little naming ceremony out at the kiln. And, uh, and then following that, we'll come back into the studio and we'll do question and answers. So what I want you to do, if you have a question, please enter it into the chat. And then when we come back in uh, to the studio and start going through those chats, we're sure we get to everybody. And I'll try to be as succinct and, and uh, brief as I can be in my answers. So I know a number of you are out there laughing <laughs> about the... I'm going to try to screen share here. The kiln is um, designed and, and the original one was designed and built by Ruggles and Rankin who are a husband and wife team. Um, and they went around the country and uh, built quite a number of these kilns including at other craft centers like uh, Penland. And um, their design was based on an ancient Japanese and Korean Naborigama design. So the kiln, the kiln can be called a number of things. In this country, we tend to call it a two chamber wood kiln, um, but a lot of people are very familiar with it when we call it a Ruggles and Rankin. And the third thing we can call it is a Naborigama. So there are three different, different names for these. That is in addition to uh, the, the people or things that a kiln might be named after. Here at Peters Valley, we have two other kilns that have names. The Onagama was named Emily back when it was built and our little soda uh, kiln is called Marlow. Um, and this one will have a, a uh, name here pretty quick. I have a few text boxes here. Um, as, as I said earlier, thank you. Thank you very much. A kiln is, is much more than just um, much more than just a tool. It's it's a a tool around which ceramists get together and find out about each other. They they cooperate, they communicate, and they hopefully make beautiful beautiful things happen by by using the fire. Um, Vince Montague, who has joined us from California this morning, a, a very special individual, said to me yesterday when I was talking to him, he called kilns uh, story makers, and, and that really caught my eye, and that's exactly what they are. This statistic that you're seeing on the screen is, is, pr is pretty amazing. You know, when I sat down and I started to do some calculations uh, around which we might think about how many people um, a kiln touches, um, it was really quite surprising at how many, and this is just the number of participants, and it's a minimum number that you're seeing there, 3,600 people. So when you figure in family and friends and the public who come to watch a firing, we're talking about a far greater number of people who are touched by these experiences and, and uh, are enlightened, hopefully, uh, and enjoy um, a little bit of that history that I was talking about with Ruggles and Rankin based on the Japanese Korean kilns. Their workshop was in 1991 and it was a, like a three week workshop. And that kiln as, as it says lasted 30, almost 30 years. Um, this, this is Charlie Lid, who you've heard us talk about. All masked up, we started the process of demolition in uh, June, early June, and we finished the kiln in uh, late October, early November. And uh, he was with me throughout the entire experience. And one of the wonderful things about building this kiln, I know, I, I understand completely about the COVID uh, situation and the sadness and so forth that, that the pandemic has brought all of us. Um, but 
um, I've never had so much time to build a kiln. And so that's a silver lining in, in that COVID cloud. And we were able to build the kiln slowly and thoughtfully. And uh, I, think, I think build a kiln that's gonna last for a really, really long time. This is an image of the old kiln right before we started to, to demolish it. And this is a little video of taking down the last chamber. Let's see if I can get this to go. It's kind of exciting, right? Um, this kiln has three arches in it. One is the main firebox arch, which you're looking at there. And that main firebox uses for its arch bricks uh, this old style of Japanese tatami brick, which is a, which is a uh, cylinder that nar is narrower, narrower at one end than at the other end. We wanted to replicate that. In fact, we wanted to replicate as much of that design as possible as we went along. So we took the kiln down, starting down at the main firebox and slowly dismantled it as we, as we went uphill. That is the main firebox that you're looking at there. This is looking into the main firebox. So those are great bars. So that's what the wood sits on. Those are steel. And as you can see, for those of you who are familiar with fireboxes, um, what was two layers of, of fire brick, high, super high temperature fire brick have now melted down into about two inches. So there was only about two inches left of brick to go before those grates would no longer stay there. Also, it melted through that wall and uh, pretty close to the, the uh, foundation over the years. And um, these are the flues, the main flues through which the, the flames initially go through to enter into the chamber where the pots or the sculptures are. So these are the main, uh, the main uh, firebox flues. As we, before we took the arches down, we went through and uh, stripped and ground the fronts of the arches so that we could understand what kind of arch brick, because the different arch bricks have numbers, one arch, is a little bit wider than a two arch and they, they get narrower as the number gets higher. And uh, this, the kiln was so coated with, coated with glass after those 30 years that it was hard to really get an idea of what kind of brick was there. So we did some grinding and then we identified those bricks. Also, as we built the kiln, um, we uh, kept a, a, a pretty detailed sketchbook of different measurements for the primarily the flues, but also um, the widths of things, the width of the chimney, the, the height of the chimney, where did the damper uh, end up and so forth. Because that kiln, if you remember, was caught, covered with a castable. So you couldn't really see a lot of these things until you uh, got into the kiln and started to dismantle it. And I have a little bit of a funny story about that. We were, we were flying, we thought we were flying blind. We didn't, we didn't have a plan to begin with and, and uh, for the kiln. So this is why we were being slow about taking the kiln apart. And then at a certain point in the process, when we were already starting to rebuild, I was talking to Susan Beecher who has joined us here and has a very similar kiln. Susan's joining us from Northern California. And Susan, I, I mentioned to Susan about this. And Susan said, well, you dummy, I gave you the, a, a little bit of a floor plan, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> so I went and went through all my files and sure enough, I had a little bit of a floor plan there. So, um, you know, go figure. Uh, we started building on the rebuild. We started down at the main firebox, which is the lower level. The kiln steps up the hill. It is on a concrete foundation with concrete blocks on top of that. So the air can pass through underneath the kiln. What Charlie and I wanted to do is we wanted to rebuild the kiln with all of the walls tied in. The previous kiln had all been built, each section had been built separately. And so it had really opened up and it had started to open up really early. And, um, uh, and so we wanted to try to get that kiln more tied together. So we started at the bottom and, and worked our way up. 
So amongst the things that we needed to do in order to achieve that is that we need to bring the different levels up to, uh, to level um, elevation. So you see a combination of concrete board, wonder board on the left, and uh, K28s. We use K28s in this kiln, which are a super high uh, temperature fire brick, but are also insulating. So those are, those are shims that help, uh, helped us level that up. Anytime we needed shims, we went with the K28s. So this is now built up to the first firebox. And that first firebox is inside, what it will be the inside of the first chamber. Two chambers, three fireboxes, one firebox for each chamber and a main. Um, we, also, uh, we also introduced uh, clean outs in each of the fireboxes. And this is Covinda who did the documenting. And I think in that picture, Covinda is contemplating or meditating on a little central wall that we introduced in this design that goes the entire length of the kiln as part of that tie-in. So instead of having five grape bars, we went with three grape bars instead with one of those grape bars being this central wall. And I have a photograph of that. But you can, see the, you can see the two layers of flues there, the openings that go into the kiln. So now in this photograph, we're up on to the last and final layer up there to the left. And that is going to be the salt kiln, a chamber in which we throw salt. There's that central wall that I was talking about. So normally in the original design, there were five uh, great, uh, great bars, which are those, those long bricks there. And um, over the years, those great bars had, had uh, deteriorated a number of times. So I'd, I had replaced them a number of times. And uh, at a certain point, I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to experiment and see if you really need a great bar for this, this kiln. So I took out the great bars and we did a firing um, with one of the groups. I think it may have been the Portchester group. And, um, and sure enough, that, fire, that kiln fired just perfectly the same without great bars. So about 10 years ago, I took those out. But on this design, I decided to put three in and, and use that, that middle wall to really tie the, the flue walls supporting the arches to the floor, into the floors. And that's looking at it from the end near the main firebox. And you can see the bricks on the right that are in the sunlight. Those are stepping up as they go. And that, that is a pretty good uh, illustration of how that wall was, those, that wall is a continuous wall all the way to the end, all the way to where the chimney is. Um, to do the arches, um, I had the help of a magnificent human being who many of you know is Max Seinfeld. And so Charlie and Max and I um, did the two chambers, uh, the two arches, and this is the uh, setup for that. So on those, on those cinder blocks or concrete blocks is a car jack. And the car jack is supporting a double two by four that runs the, a beam that runs through the length of the uh, arch form. And that allows us to raise and lower that arch accordingly because bricks aren't perfect and neither are human beings. So um, we have that as a, as a backstop for making things a little bit easier. And there you can see um, the, the car jack holding up that beam which supports the arch form. The two holes in the arch form, there are four holes, two on each side, and those are for being able to lift that form out and carry it more easily. Um, to start the, the wall off for each of the arches, uh, we use K28s rather than a castable. That's that little, the little tiny arch sliver that you see there. And uh, those were mortared in out of the, like I said, the K28. So, so those bricks don't melt until they're almost 3000 degrees, which you're never gonna get to even close in this kiln. Um, so a little bit more rugged um, than the original castable. These are the three amigos practicing safe distancing. And uh, here's the first chamber firebox with Max um, stacking the arch on one side and Charlie on the other side. And when you build an arch, you kind of work in tandem with each other, making sure that one side isn't getting too heavy and the other side not. 
And, uh, and then to remove it, uh, the car jack is dropped, the drops the arch form, and then uh, two people on two sides slide that arch form out of the, out of the kiln. So there you can see the, the two arches. This is a different view of it from the back. Um, now, the, uh, the main firebox arch, the tatami arch, was uh, needed uh, skew backs as well. And skew backs are the bricks that start the arch. Uh, that support the arch on the vertical walls. And so for the skew backs on this arch, we used a combination of a high temperature castable as a backup with a lot of alumina in it. And then these, uh, these number one arch brick. This is a tatami. So these are handmade. Um, sometimes they were wheel thrown. Uh, they're, they're made very thick. And this is one of the original tatamis. We were able to save quite a few of these, these guys. Um, they were made out of a really wonderful castable that lasted all these years. But this one you can see is pretty uh, degraded up at the top end of it. And you can see the end at the top is narrower than the one at the bottom. And each tatami brick has a, three grooves cut into it so that when those are put into place with grout or mortar, the mortar uh, gets into that groove and, and keeps that brick from just sliding out of the arch. So the arches started off just like the old one with uh, these, uh, these fire brick, these are straights. And an arch form, the wood piece there is started to be calculated to fit to the other side of that skew back that I just showed you the picture of. Then um, this is the way that I did this form because this form cannot, this arch form cannot be slid out of the kiln like those other two. So this arch form is, is, is built kind of in place and then burnt out later. So you can see the, the construction of that. And now the skew backs, one row of skew backs on the left and one row of skew backs on the right are ready for the tatamis. And the masonite covers the arch form and allows us to insert the tatamis into that. And those all have been put in there and secured with, with a very thick, very sandy, groggy, super high temperature uh, castable. This is working on the chimney. It has a 16 foot chimney, two dampers. It's corbelled in two places as the chimney rises. As you see, those corbels are those step-ins and the two slots are for the dampers. The hole up above uh, in the, the chimney that you see there is a passive damper. If you pull the bricks out of that during a firing, it slows the draft of the chimney down. And uh, so that's one way of slowing the, the speed of climb in a kiln, it's also a way of, of introducing a little more reduction or, or more buildup of gases in the chamber, which bring the color to the clay. After the, all of the refractory brick is uh, built and put in place, then the kiln is covered with this kaowol blanket. Kaowol is a high temperature refractory that was invented uh, for the space shuttle at uh, NASA and was the backup for the insulator behind the tiles on the space shuttle. And um, in its early days, it was too expensive for potters to get their hands on, but now it's roughly in the, in the same volume. Um, it's uh, roughly the same price as an insulating brick. So it's highly insulating um, and goes on there in place of putting another layer of insulating fire brick on the kiln. The, uh, the fiber blanket is attached with uh, nails. And then we start to put the castable covering on it. And the castable holds the kiln in place. It gives it a little more rigidity, gives it a little more uh, oomph. Um, it insulates, helps seal um, off the outside air from the kiln with wood firing. It's a passive process. It's not under pressure like you, it would be if it were a gas kiln with pressurized burners. A wood kiln, it draws its air source um, from wherever it can get it. So if you have a lot of leaks in a kiln, um, it's drawing uh, air into it and that might not be conducive to getting the kinds of color or reduction in the glazes and the clay body that you want. So it's covered with a castable and that castable is mixed just like uh, cement would be mixed uh, in order to do a concrete foundation. It's a mixture of, the castable is a mixture of Portland cement, 
Kristen mentioned our local cement dealer who, who made a very nice donation and uh, sand and fire clay and sawdust. So those are the main ingredients of the castable. They're put on by, it's put on by hand and then troweled. This is kiln almost finished where the, we're right at the base of the chimney and ready to put the last bit of the castable on. That's after the first snowstorm this year, right after <laughs> we finished the castable. That's basically what the kiln looks like now. And uh, this is the bottom end of the kiln at the firebox. And those slots on top, the five slots are for the steel grate. So those, the bars fit through those openings there. The second larger holes that uh, in the middle are just extra air that can come under the grate bars if you need it. And then the very bottom ones are what we call mouse holes. Those are additional air and also we feed the, the mouse holes with wood during the firing. Uh, so the air is preheated before it enters the, the chamber. Um, again, we couldn't have rebuilt the kiln without all of your support. Two funders, the Post Foundation and the Julia Tur Kiln Foundation, or Foundation for the Ceramic Arts, helped us make it over the finish line with significant gifts. We're honored by their selection of and support for our project. Um, at this time, we are going to go out to the kiln and we're going to do a little naming ceremony. And I want to introduce you to a person. Her name uh, was Julia Tur. She is Vince Montague's wife. And um, she is the namesake of the foundation from which we received this, this really generous uh, gift to, to um, finish off the fundraising. Julia was born in California. She learned to make pots actually in high school. She went on to uh, study at UC Berkeley and Columbia University. And she started off in English, um, English literature slash writing, and then navigated her way um, to filmmaking. And uh, she, she was a filmmaker in New York. Uh, she moved back to California, where she met Vince, by the way. Uh, Vince is a noted um, California potter and a, and a noted writer and uh, journalist. And um, they met and they moved back to California where Julia took up the um, uh, working in television there uh, with her filmmaking background and so forth. So she worked in San Francisco television for a really long time. And um, she uh, happened to miss making pots and so forth. And she went out to one of our sister schools, Penland, in North Carolina and took a workshop with Cynthia Bringle and, and Jack Troyer, took a couple of workshops and, and had her love for ceramics reignited. And um, she then took another workshop or studied with Allegheny Meadows. And Allegheny is credited with, with helping Julia make the decision to become a professional potter, which she did. She gave up her her filmmaking. Uh, she also worked for Yahoo, by the way, which is which is pretty amazing. And um, and so she she gave up those careers and became a, a studio potter. And um, and then we tragically lost her in 2009. And so the her family, her brother, her mother and father, her uncle, his daughter, a cousin, um, uh, several people from her family. Um, came together in a collaboration with Vince and started the Julia Tur Foundation. And that, that foundation funds special kiln projects all over the country because Vince very, very clearly um, uh, understands how important a tool a kiln is to really helping finish off work and bringing people together in collaborative sorts of ways. And, and like he said, they're, they're story makers. And uh, one can't fire a, a wood kiln without going away with a story. So um, anyway, that, that is Juliet, uh, her background. And uh, we couldn't be more grateful for the, the great support that, that Vince and Julia's family have given us. Um, we send our love to all of you. Um, so now we are going to go outside, bear with, bear with us. You're gonna follow me through the studio and um, I'm going to introduce you 
to the kiln. And we're gonna stop share here. And I think that's good. So come on, everybody. Sometimes, sometimes I like this Zoom thing and sometimes I really don't. And this is one of those times I love it and hate it, being followed through a space. <laughs> On my way out the door, I, I grabbed one of the original tatami bricks so you can see the scale of it and see what it looks like. So it's hollow and you can see it's pretty it has a pretty thick cross section. And, uh, and then the end of it is solid and is not hollow. So that gives you some idea of it to talk. So we have a couple of things happening out here all at once because we have we have a couple of traditions here that I'm just going to I wanted to pay a little bit of uh, respect to um, because the kiln originated in Japan and, and Korea. Um, they have a tradition of putting uh, gifts on the kiln um, and uh, so that the kiln will be looked after while it's firing. So you'll have a good firing, uh, successful firing. Um, and so it's, a, it's a, a blessing and I'm not even going to try to speak Japanese or Korean, but I did want to, um, I did want to pay respect to that tradition because that's where the kiln originated, the, the original design. So. On the kiln here, you can see several things. So we have, we have salt here, and we have John Dix's beautiful little sake pitcher. John Dix is a potter working in Japan. Unfortunately, he, he sent me a note this morning saying that he wasn't able to join us because he's firing a kiln out in the country and it's three o'clock in the morning. And there's some sake in there and I'm going to pour into a beautiful little, beautiful little chalice made by Takashi Yasuda, a close friend of ours in the valleys. So we'll pour that. And during a typical firing that has to be kept full. You must not ever, ever let the, let the sake evaporate, nor do you drink it, nor are you supposed to drink it, but I'm sure there are some. Um, and so I would like to unveil the name of the kiln and uh, to all of you. And I know that this name is going to bring everybody who fires this kiln, everybody who attends a firing here, um, a great fortune and great luck because she was a super special person. something something special we're going to um so the, the kiln is going to be named after julia and we're going to have a, a little plaque made um for that what is really wonderful is i found out a story last night from vince in that um uh, penland also uh, a number of years ago received a grant from the foundation and they named their kiln after julia so there are now two julia kilns um, out there in the world. In fact, there are more Julia kilns, but two of them named after Julia that, that I'm aware of. And, um, and Penland, of course, is one of Peters Valley's sister schools and is part of the craft school experience. Uh, so that was really a lovely coincidence and, and thing to learn um, just last night. So if you remember, there's a form inside this, inside this chamber here. This is the main firebox. And it's the one that couldn't be slid out of the kiln. So as part of the, the dedication, I have left that form in the, in the kiln. And today, 
through late tonight, I'm going to be burning out that form. So I'm going to light a little fire here and, uh, and then we'll go back inside and we'll do the question and answer, but I'm gonna get that fire going as part of the dedication ceremony. So you all get to see the first lighting of the, of the kiln. Uh, oh, and here's the other American tradition, uh, or not the other American tradition, the other tradition. So we have, we have the, the Japanese up there, but then we're gonna light it with these. I think we've got it going. Isn't that funny? This is a brand new lighter too. <laughs> brand new lighter on full. It's okay. It's okay. Covinda's whispering to me and saying, it's okay. So normally in a firing, this is this is down here at these mouse holes. This is exactly where we would start a firing at first and start to preheat the kiln and so that it can go up in temperature nice and slowly. And uh, so we would start the fire in this this hole and this hole here. This is where the great bars go, and the all these other openings would be closed with brick. So I have wood in this this air intake um, so that this can get going. And then slowly but surely the arch is going to be burned out. But I have to go super slow today because the castable that is holding those tatami bricks that, that I talked about earlier, that is green and it's thick. So some areas of that castable might be this thick, three inches thick. So we have to go really slow with it. And uh, so this fire is going to be happening all during the day. So we'll go back inside and we'll take your questions. Okay, so now Lakota, maybe you're on there and. Uh, sure, do you, um, do you wanna do it where I read a couple from the comments or you'll have people uh, on there? Yeah, let's do that because I'm not seeing them. I don't see the, the question. So if you wouldn't mind helping me out with that, that would be great. And, uh, uh, and everybody, you just fire away, don't be shy. Yeah, well, I was going to ask if you, would you like everyone to turn their audio back on if they have a question or? Sure, that would be fine. Yeah, turn it if, uh, yep. <laughs> well, there is a question. Can we get a copy of this recording? And I can answer that, which is yes. Um, it'll be posted on our YouTube channel within the next couple of days, um, definitely by Sunday night. And uh, there's another question. Where do the tatami bricks come from? Ah, we make those. So we, we mix those, uh, the material for those just like you would clay in a clay mixer. And uh, it's, it's a formula, it's a high temperature formula. And um, it's, primarily, it's primarily fire clay with alumina hydrate in it and uh, uh, a lot of silica sand. Uh, and pretty simple, pretty straightforward stuff, yeah. That's the formula for that. So fire clay, silica sand, and uh, alumina hydrate. Wow. Um, Peter Simon is wondering, are there new shelves and pots for the project? Peter Simon. Posts. I meant posts. New, new posts. 
We have a few new shelves, but our, our shelves are our shelves are still they have a lot of years to go. Good. How about the door? Are there new bricks for the door? Some new bricks, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep using the keep using the old ones until they die. Great. Yeah. I got a question from Eliza Paley. Which which part was most fun and which part was most stressful? The most fun part, I think, was just this having this extended period of time, extended period of time to spend with Charlie, to spend with Covinda, to spend with Max, um, and uh, really be able to think about what we're doing and having the time to do that and not being in such a hurry. Uh, but the arches are always great fun for me. I mean, there's just something super satisfying with putting an arch on a kiln and pulling that form out of it and stepping back and the thing is staying in place there. I mean, my, my intellectual brain tells me, yeah, I understand why that arch is there, but my, my animal primal brain is like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. The most stressful part of it is this. Okay, next question. So Peter um, wonders, were there any, well, this is sort of a similar question. Were there any particular challenges in building the kiln or any idiosyncrasies that make it unique? Uh, let's see, uh, we tried to follow the original design as close as possible. Why? Because that kiln design, and when I say design, that has to do with all of the different uh, proportions of air intake and, and volume of chamber and so forth, height of chimney and so forth are perfect in my mind. I've, I've never fired a kiln that is so efficient and can be, and therefore, because it's efficient, that you can, you can play around with and experiment with. And, and um, it's just a beautiful, Ruggles and Rankin just are geniuses in my mind. Um, that, that's such a beautiful design. So um, what makes it unique is that we did, which I didn't mention earlier, is that uh, compared to their design, we put an extra wall, facing wall on the main, inside the main firebox up against that step. Because I think this kiln is because of the way that we built it and, and the materials, of course, um, uh, we built it with the best materials. Um, that kiln is going to last even longer. But if that that front wall in that main firebox uh, melts away like the last one does, then this gives us an extra wall. So the kiln is actually four and a half inches longer than the, the previous one. And those four and a half inches are down at the main firebox end. And uh, so that makes it kind of unique. And I think that little central wall that goes the length of the kiln um, from the main firebox on up to the chimney, I think that that will make, uh, make it unique too, because it's not going to, floors are not going to pull away from fireboxes and et cetera, uh, like they did in the last one. But, you know, 30 years, 30 year history, you know, 30 years of firing a kiln, that's a pretty good long time, especially when you consider how many firings we do in that kiln. It lasted a good long time, but I think this one is, is hopefully going to last even longer, okay? Brian's wondering what the doors of the kiln are composed of. The doors are brick. And so, and brick, they're a mixture of two different kinds of brick. One, an insulating brick, and two, a hard fire brick. And the hard fire bricks, there are just a couple of layers of those per door, and those are to help tie in the insulating bricks. So, the vast majority of each door is uh, made of insulating fire brick. It, those bricks have lots of air in them. Um, so if you touch them, they don't, you, you don't get necessarily burnt on them and they are stacked. Tom Nugabauer is wondering, did the original kiln use K28 insulation bricks also or hard bricks? Great question. Uh, no, um, the original kiln used K26s and K23s. K23s for the subfloors and K26s for the back walls. So what we did is that we used a combination of K23s, K26s, and K28s. 
all put into strategic into different areas of that where we know that it gets hot hotter than other places. So the K28s go to the super hot spots, the K26s go to the less hot, and the K23s are at, under the floor where it, where it really doesn't get too hot at all. Stephanie Vasco is wondering, are there any traditions around the first pieces that you fire? Mm, that's a good question. Also, to, uh, just to back up on that last question, we also used, of course, we use clippers and empires which are the, uh, the dense fire brick. So there, as, as you look at the kiln, you'll see some layers of those kinds of bricks going through, the, going through the kiln. And the floor, the top of the floors are all clippers. Uh, the fire boxes are all clippers. So um, yeah, it's not all the insulated fire brick, which I think I made it sound like. Um, and the, uh, the other question was, that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, here, I, yeah, I think that the that first firing is going to be just a selection of pots and sculptures like like most firings. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I'm not really sure if if specific pots are made for first firings in Japan or not. There would be other people who would know better than me about that. So I'm sorry I can't answer that one more thoroughly. Ellen is wondering, do we have any firings that people can bring pots to fire who are not in a Peters Valley class specifically? Uh, yeah, yeah, most of our most of our firings of this Nabori Gama are community firings. Uh, and by that, these are community groups who rent the kiln and come and fire for, for the weekend, um, usually arriving on Thursdays, staying through Sundays. It's a three to four day process. Um, and so what I would recommend to you is find out if there's a community group near you that actually comes and rents the kiln and see if you can get on that on that crew. Um, but uh, the other firings, of course, are workshop firings. Yeah. But it's never far from my mind to do what you're what you're talking about. So um, leave your name, would you, in the chat and your contact info. Bill is wondering how important is the angle iron you have around the kiln? Super important. So the angle iron, because this design of kiln, when you think of onagamas, you think of kilns that are buried in the earth. So there is earth um, structure around the kiln. And uh, that earth structure helps to, uh, that berming, which is what it's called, helps to hold those arches together. In this, design or style of kiln, the kiln is up standing vertically up out of the ground. And because kilns, uh, because bricks expand um, surprisingly a lot during a firing, they expand and contract upon cooling, that kiln moves around a lot. And, um, and so uh, walls tend to expand and open up during a firing, and then they don't completely close back together again. One of the reasons for that is because of friction. The other reason is that you start to get deposits of, of ash, and which turns to glass and so forth, into those openings. So every time you fire, those walls open. Any crack in the wall or whatever opens more and more and more over time um, if it doesn't have berming. Um, and in this case, if it doesn't have a steel structure. So that steel structure is really important for holding these kilns together for a longer period of time than they would if it, it doesn't have steel structure. Otherwise, you need to berm the kiln. You need to put a lot of material on it, no matter what that material is. It can be boulders, rocks, concrete, more brick, more castable, dirt, that kind of thing. Yeah, the steel is kind of a... Um, is a little bit, uh, I guess it it's a little bit of a shortcut and less less material involved in, in uh, using steel. Yeah, it's a modern modern approach. Joan, we're also wondering, will the first few firings be less juicy because the kiln is new? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would imagine, but but with the uh, yeah, that's a great question and. Um, the, uh, particularly in the salt chamber, because there isn't any residual salt that has melted and formed glass on the, uh, on the interior walls. Um, when that happens with every firing, that uh, vapor, that sodium vapor comes off of those, out of that glass and 
uh, imbues the atmosphere of that, that uh, chamber with sodium, which is a flux, which causes clay and, uh, to, to glass up a little bit, to color up a little bit more, and, and it kind of alters color in the glazes just a little bit. So the more often you fire the, the uh, kiln, the more that glass builds up, particularly in the back chamber. And, um, and so you have to, on the first couple firings, you have to put in draw rings, which are little, little loops of clay, and you need to salt the bejesus out of it and pull out those draw rings to see what kind of glass, what kind of accumulation of glass is happening. Um, front chamber, not so much. I find with firing wood kilns that, that uh, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. There's, there is sodium in wood. Um, trace sodium that has been drawn up into the tree through its roots and deposited uh, onto the bricks on the interior, but not like if you're throwing rock salt into or uh, table salt, kosher salt into a into a chamber during a firing. That's that's a heavy duty fast way of building up sodium glass inside. There's a question from Facebook Live um, from Catherine. Do you find the result of the firing? on the pieces is different than firing in an electric kiln or a gas fired kiln? Yes, in a wood, in a wood kiln, uh, uh, wood kilns tend to be, now I'm just gonna generalize hugely here, so forgive me, but um, a wood kiln is special in that it le because of the action of the ash and the gases, gases are coming from the, the, the combustion of the wood, um, that they leave uh, traces of the process. As the chimney draws air through it, it's like a vacuum cleaner and it is pulling those gases and the ash through the, through the chambers. And that ash is uh, sticking to the pots. It's, it's floating down onto the pots. It's being drawn right up, right up to the front faces of the pots that are near the fireboxes. And uh, so you can, at the end of a wood firing, um, depending on how long the wood firing was and so forth, you can take a pot and you can turn it and you can tell which side was the front where the fire was coming from and which is the back where the fire, where the fire was going past the pot. So wood firing really leaves a record of, of what the process is that it went through. And, um, and, and if you're a, a person who fires wood and lives with wood fired pots, one of the wonderful things about wood firing is that it almost always gives you a, it, it imprints on your mind um, what that experience was like and, and what kind of story was made in Vince Montague's words. Um, and so um, if you compare wood firing to a gas kiln, gas is, releases gases also, so you're able to more easily uh, imbue the chamber with, um, with uh, uh, gases that, that cause a shift in the color of clay from say, for example, a clay that might look gray fired in an electric kiln can come out kind of orange or toasty colored in a gas kiln. And that's the interaction of those gases with the materials in the, in the clay bodies. Um, and then, and then the electric kiln, which uh, doesn't alter the doesn't alter so much the color of the clay, but rather the strength of the clay. So, um, and in all three cases, the the clay becomes ceramic. I hope that. A question from Alan Willoughby: Will you coat the brick on the inside of the chambers to resist ash and salt buildup? Yeah, I, um, Alan, what, what I've been using, I've been working with Bill Cardi from Alfred for 20 years um, on coatings. And uh, what's really interesting about that, that question is that um, over the years, we were constantly testing different coatings. And in every single salt kiln I fired, I had a, had a brick in there that I'd put different coatings on. And of course, we used the different coatings on the door, if you remember. Um, and so forth and really tested it. And what's so interesting is we started off with combinations of zircon and alumina um, way back when and, and some EPK or kaolin to suspend the mix. But um, over the years, we've come up with the world's most magical formula for it. And, and it's 100, pretty much 100% silica with 2% clay in it. 
And uh, the reason for that is that the sodium doesn't, uh, if you spray the surface with silica, which seems counter, uh, counterintuitive, um, that sodium attacks that layer of silica, turns it to glass, and it doesn't need to go any further into the brick. So it, it generally stays right out there on the surface. And um, uh, yeah, so this kiln will be getting coated with that. Catherine Thomas is wondering, can you put pots in the main firebox? Uh, no, no, there isn't, there isn't uh, access. I mean, you could reach your arm through and put a pot up onto the interior wall there, possible. Um, but of course the wood kind of gets up onto that when you're stoking the wood kind of gets up onto that 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 shelf let's call it a shelf um in there but uh it's not not impossible to put some some smaller pieces up inside that those openings and that's a wonderful question because charlie and i put larger stoke holes in this design than the the previous kiln so they're so be able to put wood at more angle and so forth plus you might be able to reach up in there and put a pot up there and put it in a safe little corner up there so we'll we'll definitely be trying that joni is wondering what is the principle behind the cylindrical design of the tatami brick and why is it used over the firebox Hmm. Um, so in, in ancient Japan and Korea, the kilns were built out of those. And a tatami brick could be even a big chunky, chunky thing like that. Um, and then in areas where they wanted it tighter, the, the angle, the curve tighter, they would go with a shape like that and so forth. So tatamis have lots of different kinds of shapes and, and sizes to them. Over time, um, the tatamis really have become more of a more of a, a smaller shape, and they are a cone. I would call them a cone shape as opposed to necessarily a cylindrical shape. That's so that they don't fall in. If it's a, just a straight cylinder shape, um, it can slide out of its its um, its mount or its purchase and uh, fall into the firebox. So you don't want that. So they're cone shaped. Um, and the reason that they, I think that Ruggles and Rankin used it on this design is because I think that they, I, I don't know, we'd have to ask them, but I think they were paying homage to, to the original Japanese Naborigama uh, techniques of, of building arches. And so they built that first arch there with the tatamis. Um, uh, and there might be a more practical reason for that too, uh, the sealing that arch form um, building with an arch form. And it's a pretty quick way to build. Um, you don't have to figure out uh, curvature and style of brick or dimension of brick when you build with a tatami because you're able to uh, be spontaneous and, and kind of more intuitive as you build with the, uh, with the tatamis. Mel that, that, that felt important to us. That felt important to, to build with the tatamis just like the original had been. Mel Gromick is wondering approximately how many normal size pots fill each chamber. 200. Yeah, so we can get we can get around uh, we can get around uh, 300 to 400 pots in the kiln um, pretty regularly. Of course, people come with larger pots and different sizes, as you know, <clears throat> and that isn't including uh, stuffers. Um, and when I say a regular pot, I almost always refer to six inches by six inches by six inches. So that would be. Bobby Free is wondering, um, you mentioned that fiber was nailed to the kiln. Nailed how? Simply as a nail and hammer? And then he said, thanks, Bruce. Hmm. Yeah, what we did is we cut up plastic lids. Um, we had lots of, lots of old plastic uh, lids laying around. And, and so we cut those up. Those became a washer. Then we got a, um, a nail, uh, these very small, narrow nails. They aren't finished nails. They're, they have, they have uh, spirals on them. And uh, we put those through the, through the uh, lids and use those, those, that, that uh, piece of plastic there. As, I, I don't know what word I'm trying to find for it, but um, instead of just a nail through the fiber, we, we use that plastic, a washer. Thanks, Colton. And... Um, <laughs> 
And, uh, and then the nail, what we did is you'd find a little area in between a brick, because and those nails are pretty small. The bricks have been mortared. We mortared the kiln. So those, those uh, bricks are, have a little bit of space between them. And then we just put that nail into that uh, split there. And then the plastic after the castable's on and it's holding everything together and there's uh, chicken wire on that also, um, that plastic's probably just going to um, uh, burn out, evaporate, melt and disappear. Yeah, and the nails are the nails are about two and a, maybe two and a quarter inches long. So two and a half inches long. Vicki is wondering, where does the wood come from? How much do you use for a typical firing and what different results have you seen from the different woods? Uh, that's beautiful. Okay, the wood is all, is all local. We're in a national park, so we can't be importing uh, woods from a long ways away and so forth um, because they, of course, don't want the introduction of, of invasive stuff. Um, so we use a local uh, wood supplier here and, um, and uh, we split it or we cut it to length to go in. Most of our wood are mixed um, species of wood. The kiln fires faster uh, and a little more dirty. By dirty, more reduction, more black smoke and so forth if we fire with pine uh, because pine has more, more uh, creosote in it or tar. And, uh, uh, but it fires, fires possibly just a little bit slower if we use all hardwood. Um, and the hardwood is always a mixture of, of different species right here near the park. Uh, and um, let's see, what are the differences? I'll tell you what, uh, you know, I'm going to enter into a real fray here with you, but I, uh, but I like to, I guess, be a little controversial about certain things. But I, you know, over my... Um, uh, experience of firing wood kilns, um, it's not so much species as it is where the tree was grown because, because um, trees have roots. The roots are, are picking up the minerals from the ground. The minerals are changeable all over, right? So half a mile from Peters Valley, you might have soil that has more iron in it than say five miles away. Um, each species absorbs minerals at different uh, levels and um, uh, at different amounts and so forth, but they, but every species does absorb all of those minerals. So I think it has actually possibly more to do with the, with the mineral content in the wood and in the bark than it necessarily does species. But I do think that each species brings its own uh, because it has its own um, uh, genetic makeup and it brings its own uh, unique qualities to how much of those min minerals it picks up and it uh, utilizes in its, it, in its overall health. So um, uh, it's kind of like uh, wine. Wine is very dependent on the, uh, the earth in which the, the grapes were grown. So um, yeah. That would be my answer to that. Um, there's a, a few more questions. Tanya is wondering, you just mentioned mortaring the kiln. The arches too, are they able to expand during the firing? Um, uh, the arches are not um, uh, mortared and uh, those are loose. They are being held tight from the ends with the, with the steel and the, the castable. So the, the, the walls around the arches are, are all, um, are all uh, mortared. We, in all fairness, we did dip those bricks in, uh, the arch bricks into super, super thin mortar, like almost like milk. Um, so you could hardly even tell that they, they had been, that they had been mortared, not like the, the wall bricks, which you can tell are, are mortared. So just super, super thin, um, high temperature uh, mortar. But generally, uh, an arch doesn't need to be doesn't need to be mortared, and if and you definitely don't want to go with a, a thicker kind of uh, mortar, even like a sixteenth of an inch thick. I think is probably can be too much because because mortar can crumble as it ages, it decomposes, and so forth, and fall into pots. It can melt, um, that kind of thing. 
Mel says, I remember you have a stoking regime. Will it now be a learning curve? When and how much would you add? Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, that gets back to one of the previous questions, which I forgot to answer. But yeah, I think this kiln, every kiln fires differently. So um, even though this is the same design with the same, um, you know, air and, and so forth going into it, I think that it's going to fire differently because of number one, different materials. So these are, these are different bricks than the original was built with. These are, these are, um, and we've, we have, uh, spotlighted um, or targeted different kinds of bricks for different areas of the kiln um, and so forth. So I think that that's going to have a, an impact on how it fires. Uh, there is water in the, in the brick um, still. So that has to be driven off. There's water in the fiber that has to be driven off and there's water in the castable. So um, those just the fact that there's water there and is going to take a while to dry off, uh, to be driven off, more than just one firing, actually, it'll take a couple of firings to do that. So those first couple firings are going to be really different, I think. Um, but after, after we figure the kiln out and so forth, I think it's going to uh, be pretty much like the, like the old one. Uh, oh, how much, oh, how much wood? We usually use about a cord and a half per firing. Rena says, what emotions did you go through as you demolished and then rebuilt the kiln? This is your baby, right? Thanks, Bruce, for bringing us along with you in your journey. Quite a feat. Oh, oh thank you, Rena. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, it was, yeah, I get, yeah. You know, I see kilns as tools. I, you know, like a paintbrush for a, for a painter, um, a wheel for a potter, uh, you know, a rib a uh, cutting torch for a steel guy, you know, who's, who's works in steel. And, um, you know, I see, I, I do see kilns as tools, um, but um, like Vince was saying, there are also these story makers and each kiln that I fired during my life has, has fired uh, differently than the next kiln. And, and so they definitely have their own personalities. Um, and ways that they like to be fired. And most kilns have multiple personalities and multiple ways they like to be fired. So there isn't just a best way or and a, a worst way, I think. Um, it's much more complex than that, which is, which is a really great thing. Um, to this kiln, because uh, I spent 20 years firing it and um, have seen so many remarkable pots come out of that, that, um, that tool, that kiln. Um, and I have so many memories of, of my times with people uh, firing with them in groups and so forth. Um, I, 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 of course, attach a great deal of emotion to that. And um, so tearing, say you're gonna make me cry. Um, mm -hmm. So tearing it down or, or demolishing it, I think both Charlie and I, uh, because Charlie has fired the kiln, um, God, so many times. Uh, he brings his high school kids here and fires in the middle of winter every year. Uh, so he had emotional attachment to the kiln too. So uh, we did talk about that as, as we took things down. And, um, and so, yeah, yeah, it's, it's an emotional thing. At the same time, I was really looking forward to building a new kiln and uh, trying out a couple of different thoughts I had in terms of trying to build a kiln that will last even longer um and uh do a beautiful job of building it um so there's that attachment to it that that attachment to craftsmanship that i really um think is important and yeah you know the whole thing's kind of kind of emotional and sarah is wondering when do you plan on doing the first firing and she's wonderful presentation Hmm. Uh, yeah, well, we're, we're going to try to do a firing before we, we have a, a group, uh, a local group, Lafayette Clayworks, who I'm sure there are a number of folks um, are participants in that who have been firing with me for 20 years. Um, and uh, we're going to fire again this spring. Um, and uh, so, you know, I'd like to try to do a firing before that, um, try the, to the best of my ability to get that done. Uh, but if not, we're gonna be firing at Lafayette. Clayworks will be the first firing, the maiden, maiden firing. I, I, that's everything. I only see one more question. 
um, from Arlene, and that's just how much did it actually cost to build the new kiln um, aside from donations? Yeah, good, good question. Um, the, uh, and one of the reasons I'm saying that's good is that I think that's really helpful to know um, for, for a couple different reasons. Uh, but first, before I, I answer that question, that reminds me that there are two guys who live locally, Aaron and Matt Hull, who I meant to thank um, at the outset. And the reason I associated those two amazing guys um, to that question is because um, we had to get those bricks, all that material off of a flatbed and the truck couldn't come down to where we're building. It, come, it could only get to within, um, let's say uh, three city blocks in distance to the, to the studio. Um, and we had to get those bricks off of that semi truck and get them off in a timely manner. And Aaron and, and Matt have some really great equipment um, and uh, front end loaders and so forth that we were able to, to uh, get those bricks off the, off the truck. And I called Aaron the other day and darn it, that guy didn't get back to me. I'm just remembering that. Um, but anyway, I owe them a huge, huge thank you for helping helping us get those bricks down off the truck and onto the ground where we could then carry them in by hand um, to the to. site. And um, and so the answer to the question is, I think that this kiln all told in materials. I'm gonna I'm going to take a wild guess. All told in materials around thirty thirty two thousand thirty two thousand dollars. Um, that doesn't include labor and, and uh, some consumables and so forth. But, um, but keep in mind that we built with uh, new material and uh, the, the best materials we could get our, our hands on from Harbison Walker International, which is a refractory company, not too far from here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And, uh, uh, and there are a lot of bricks out there in the world for, for recycling um, that a potter can get their hands on, a ceramist can get their hands on and build without having to purchase brand new uh, materials. And, and part of the game is just identifying, making sure that you identify those bricks to make sure that they can withstand the temperatures that you need to, to achieve in the, in the kiln itself and away you go. So. We do have a, a few more questions that have come in. Do you want to keep answering questions? Sure. Bruce? Well, I'll be happy to keep reading them to you. Sure, I can go all until, uh, let's see, tomorrow, because I told <laughs> Covinda I'd go for a walk tomorrow with me. Um, Jeffrey Butts is actually wondering, will the first firing be on YouTube? Oh, wow. Oh, I guess that's something we have to figure out. Wow. We could that's document. cool. Yeah. We could document. Cool idea. I like that, Jeffrey Butts. Good for you. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Have have you built an aborigama kiln before? What kind of kilns do you usually build, and how many have you built? That's from Beth. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. I have built aborigamas. Uh, let's see. I'm not too sure how many kilns I've built. Um, I, 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 it would take me a while to figure out. I, I don't know how many I've built. Uh, let's see. The most common kiln that I build, I would say, is a soda kiln. Uh, salt soda kiln gas fired is the is the most common and mary frets asks what is the normal lifespan of this kiln i saw nabori gama shiro otani my dear friend from shigaraki japan when i was visiting japan took me around and took me around to some ancient kiln sites and uh, there were some kiln sites where he's saying it's a kiln and i'm looking at it thinking it's a green hill but it, when we walked over to that green hill, there was a hole in it, just large enough for two or three people to crawl through. That kiln was so ancient um, and, and I can't, uh, I, I knew, he told me how old it was, but I can't remember, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a wild guess and say it was 800 to 1000 years old. And it was an old Naborigama. Mm -hmm. um, and from just a hundred feet away, you couldn't tell it was a kiln because it looked like the landscape. It looked like the earth. So much had happened in in those those uh, hundreds of years, thousand years. Um, so a kiln can last a really long time, especially if it's buttressed with earth. It can last a very long time. Our onagama here is is um, 
is over 30 years old now and uh, well on its way to, to living a really long life. It's in really good shape. Um, if a kiln is really maintained super well, um, a kiln can last, uh, this, this kiln, I'm, I'm hoping that it will last at least 50 years. You know, I think those are the kinds of improvements that we, we made and, and I would love nothing more than to, to hear that it lived for 50 years. It's gonna outlive me. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question or not. I got lost. <laughs> Um, I think, I think that's actually it, unless I missed any questions in the chat, but I'm pretty sure we're caught up on all of the questions that actually came in. Okay, I have, I have one um, announcement that I'd like to make in, uh, before we close. I'd like to wish our dear, dear, dear friend, Max Seinfeld, Max a million to me, because he's worth a million bucks. Um, a very happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Max. <laughs> I think it was a couple days ago, but. Oh, is it? Is it today? Oh, I thought it was maybe two, <laughs> two days ago. Or, yeah. Anyway, happy birthday, Max. And, and thank you, everybody, for joining us here. And thank you um, for uh, contributing to the project in all these different ways. Your questions were great today. That, that was a wonderful contribution to today's program. And and uh, thank you, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thank you, Vince, if you're still on there. Um, thank you very much for all of your help and, and uh, your wonderful story and Julia's wonderful story. Um, yeah, means a lot. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.